Good afternoon, DerbyCon. Yeah. Y'all enjoying the conference so far? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of good talks. Vanilla Ice was awesome last night. Looking forward to Offspring tonight. That's going to be sweet. Looking forward to that. Uh, so if you're here, you're here to talk about some social engineering. The name of my talk is Just Let Yourself In. Um, as with a lot of my talks, I like to start with a couple of quotes. Uh, the first one comes from your friend and mine, Mr. FDR. And he said, uh, so first of all, let me assert that my firm belief is that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And that will come into play later on in the talk, so keep that in the back of your mind. The second quote comes from a video game called Portal 2, and that is, the cake is a lie, from uh, GLaDOS there. That will also come into play a little bit later on. So a little bit about who I am, uh, nothing really important there. Uh, just to say that I am a Christian. What that means is that I'm just a, uh, a sinner saved by grace. Uh, I'm a husband, a father, and I've been doing pen testing for several years for all manner of stuff. Uh, I got tired of working in cubicles and decided to go into private consulting, and I've been much happier since. Uh, oh, and I just got picked up by these fine gentlemen uh, and ladies about uh, three months ago. Uh, so uh, Trusted Tech picked me up. Uh, some of the smartest guys I've ever had the pleasure of working with, hands down, truly. Uh, so if you're interested in any of their services, their booth is over by the Reg booth. Go say hi, uh, get you some swag, and, and uh, go have a chat with them. So let's take a quick poll. Uh, who here has ever received a phishing email or scammy email in their life? Pretty much everybody in the room, right? Uh, and who here has ever gotten a strange call from like Microsoft or anything like that, right? Yeah, pretty much everybody, okay. And then who here has ever had somebody try to get into a building behind them? A few less people, okay, yeah, yeah. And then an unusual one, but who here has ever asked for a raise or a promotion or anything like that? Pretty much everyone in here? Well then congratulations, all of you have either been victims of or have tried some version of social engineering. Uh, there's the official definition of social engineering there on the screen. Uh, the key points to take away from there is that it refers to the psychological manipulation of people. Um, I liked a little more uh, watered down definition and it was, uh, it's the clever manipulation of the natural human tendency to trust. Humans by nature, we are very trusting people. We like to just assume the best of folks, and, and social engineering is taking advantage of that trust to try to gain whatever it is you're looking to gain. Uh, so why is social engineering so effective? Why aren't we having this talk? Well, people are friendly and helpful. Just like I said, nobody wants to be the bad guy. Everyone likes to be friendly and hold the door for you or, or answer your you know question on the phone, whatever it is. Uh, people are also afraid. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I run into is that people are very afraid of confrontation. Nobody likes confrontation, nobody likes to get in your face or question you about stuff. They just assume if you're there or you're calling them or you're in the building that you probably belong, right? Uh, they're also easily duped. And then the big one is a lack of education and awareness. So uh, it, the big popular you know, motive is, oh, well, it's the users. The users are the weakest link. And I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't blame the users for the lack of social engineering awareness. I blame management. And then that's kind of, ooh, yeah, I know. But it's management's, you know, mission to try to train its users and try to improve its users and make its users better, right? It's not on the users. If they don't know, you can't hold them accountable. So if you're training them well, then a lot of this stuff will go down. And we'll get into that here in just a second. So for the talk today, we're going to be kind of touching on uh, three basic engineering, uh, social engineering topics, pretexting, phishing, and physical engagements. Every one of these could be a talk all on their own. You could spend hours talking about pretexting and fishing physical engagement. Uh, as a matter of fact, Jason Street uh, just did a, I think, a two or three day class about social engineering right before DerbyCon started. So all of these could be talked about. I'm just going to kind of lightly hint on all of them, give you some tips and tricks and stories, things like that. Uh, there, there have been some questions of ethics regarding social engineering on Twitter and social media and things like that. and Certain folks are on both sides of the camp. They're going, well, is social engineering right? Is it ethically right? Is it wrong to do? You know, you're taking advantage of people. You know, how, how, what, what's the, what's the deal with that? And so my opinion is, it may not necessarily be right. Uh, it, it's train how you fight, right? So in the army, we had, you train as you fight and you fight as you train. And the ethics kind of go by the wayside when you start to think that bad guys may not necessarily be ethical, right? If they're trying to take advantage of your users, they're not thinking about ethics. They're thinking about information, money, whatever it is they're trying to get. 
So you're training when you're doing social engineering engagements, you're training the users. You're not necessarily taking advantage of it. It's not a question of ethics. It's a question of training and improvement and things like that. It's just my, you know, two cents on it. Uh, so let's go into pretexting. And as we go through these slides, you'll see I like two things, and that's uh, bad stock art and awesome memes. So pretexting is nothing more than the practice of presenting yourself as someone else over the phone, right? You're trying to get information. Uh, who here has seen the movie Hackers? A lot of people haven't. Okay. Uh, so there was a uh, there was a pretty good scene at the beginning of the movie Hackers where our uh, our antihero Dade Wilson um, is trying to pretext a uh, TV station. Right? He's he's watching the TV and there's something on he doesn't like. Uh, so he calls late at night when he knows when the producers are there uh, to try and see, hey, can I, you know, social engineer this guy into changing the movie? And let's see if this works here. We'll play this short little clip for you. Uh, there we go. Security, uh, Norm. Norm is speaking. Norm? This is Mr. Eddie Benner from Accounting. I just had a... Can't really hear that, but... Uh, I'll just kind of narrate it. So he talks to Norm, the security guard, because Norm is the only one on staff right now, right? Norm doesn't really know much about computers, and he picks up on that really quick. So he says, hey, Norm, can you look at the bottom of your modem and see if you could tell me, you know, what the modem IP address is or whatever? Uh, because my computer's crashed, and I'm going to lose all my files, and I really just need to, to, to get on this thing. Uh, and Norm, being the helpful and unfortunately uneducated individual that he is about these sorts of things, he says, oh, yeah, sure, I'll take a look here. And, and he reads in the number, uh, and he's able to succeed in achieving his objective at that point, which is getting a you know, station change, and he gets the outer limits put on. Um, and as goofy as that sounds, that's really pretty accurate about how these things go. Um, and we talk about uh, pretexting and vishing and voice voice vishing uh, because there, there are incidents like this, right? Um, too many times we hear about scammers taking advantage of the less fortunate, the elderly, uh, the uneducated, things like that. Uh, and they're scamming them and they're winning. They're getting money. They're getting credit card data. They're getting, you know, grandma to send them, you know, Apple iTunes gift cards, right? They're taking advantage of people that just don't know. And so if we can help educate and improve our user awareness, as well as our families and stuff, some of this stuff will help get taken down. Now, if you ever get bored on YouTube, there are literally thousands of videos of guys that fish the fishers, as it were. So these guys will get calls and they'll record them and then, you know, kind of mess with them for several hours on a time. As a matter of fact, uh, a police department got called with an IRS scanner one time. And so the police officer was like, I'm going to record this. I got this guy. Uh, and leads them on and leads them on. And finally, it's like, by the way, this is like the Dade County Police Department or whatever. And the guy's, uh, oh, whoops, hangs up pretty quick. So that was pretty good. So how do you prepare for a pretexting engagement, right? Uh, where do you get these phone numbers? How, how are people finding this information? Uh, you can go to the company website of your target oftentimes. You go to the Contact Us page. There's all the phone numbers you could ever want right there. Um, you can go to a company directory. If you call, like, the 800 number, uh, it'll tell you over the phone, hey, here's the company directory. Press one for this guy, two for that guy. Uh, LinkedIn will oftentimes have contact us information, Facebook, Twitter. Any of the social, you know, uh, uh, social media sites will have that stuff. Uh, some of the tools you could use. Uh, there's the burner app, uh, the spoof card. Uh, there's a program called Asterisk. Uh, you can get a Google Voice number for free uh, and use that um, if you're worried about your, your phone number getting compromised. Uh, there's Viproy. Uh, you can go down to Walmart for 60 bucks and buy a burner phone uh, with some minutes on it and just make all the calls you want and throw the phone away. Um, or, really and truly, just star 67 from your own phone. Just block your number. A lot of places are not checking for blocked numbers. They just pick up the phone. They're not looking at who's on it, and they start talking. You get them to pick up the phone, you're already halfway there. Uh, so some ideas for pretexting, for trying to get your information, right? Uh, you can clone a company's website, try to get some folks to go to it, say, hey, man, can you, you know, check this link for me real quick? Um, you can drop a, uh, you know, headless device, a little malicious device on site, um, and start calling people and saying, hey, you know, I'm from IT, uh, I need your password to do this thing, or, you know, something's broken. Uh, you can imitate an employee and call the IT desk and say, hey, I'm John Smith, 
and my password's not working. Can you reset my password? As funny as it sounds, that actually works. Um, and then the other ones, you can imitate IT and you need to check something. Uh, or you can even say, hey, I'm a new employee. I'm not sure what the procedure is about this. I'm kind of lost. Can you help me out? You know, help me with my password. Uh, so we're going to do a demonstration, and I need a volunteer from the audience. Yay, there we go. Either one of you, whoever wants it. You'll go for it? Okay, very good. Yeah, come on up, come on up. So what's your name? Fred. Everyone give a big hand for Fred for me. All right now, Fred, so we're going to do a little role playing. Okay. These are actual engagements that actually happen, okay? Uh, and Fred, your job is to be, uh, let's see, for this one, uh, you're a tired, you're tired, uh, uh, older lady, it's Monday morning, you haven't had your coffee yet, things are just kind of dreary, okay? okay you so different? So just normal. Just <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're going to be reading Karen's lines, can you read that okay? Yeah. All right, so I'm me and you're Karen, okay. So, ring, ring. Uh, hi, thank you for calling Generic Company. This is Karen. Well, hey, Karen. This is John from IT. How are you doing this morning? Oh, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, it's, it's been a little busy, but... I know. Mondays always seem so awful, and this just rain isn't helping anything. Yeah, yeah. It always seems the uh, mood just gets way down there after a good weekend. Man, I am so sorry to hear. So, hey, listen, not trying to take up too much of your time, but we've been getting a lot of folks having issues logging in this morning. Have you been having any sort of login issues, black screens, passwords wouldn't work, printers garbled, anything like that? A lot of generic terms, right? Like folks aren't expecting that stuff? Login issues? Uh, no. Hey, uh, Marsha, been having any login issues? You can play Marsha, too. No login issues, <laughs> but the printer hasn't been working right since Thursday. <laughs> Oh, yeah, uh, that's right. We, we called you guys about that. Any updates? Oh, yeah, no problem, no problem. Let me just pull up that ticket, tappity tap and tapping on my keyboard, right? And I say, oh, hey, it says right here that uh, it's not been printing and you're getting a, a printer that can't connect to some kind of error or something like that? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, none of us can print from this one. We, we got to use the one in JP's office. Okay, you know what? Yeah, we want to fix it. We want to get you guys back up and running. So let me recreate this issue. Uh, if you don't mind, let me get your username and password. Uh, I can then reproduce the issue on my end, and uh, we can see if we can't expedite a fix. Oh, uh, do you do you need that to fix it? You, you already have my password, right? Well, you see, we can reset your password on lock accounts, but we can't actually see your password. Um, but in order to like recreate the issue accurately, uh, you know, I need your password to be able to see it, and, and if anything gets screwed up. Oh, okay. Uh, so you just need my password, just the one I use to log in. Yeah. Uh, so my username is going to be uh, K Mitchell. Okay. Um, M I T C H E L L. Uh, my password is Hunter Two. Awesome. Very good. Hey, great. Thanks a lot for that, and we'll be back to you shortly. You have a great day, and try to stay dry in this weather. Thank you very much. Give a big hand for my friend here. So that's one that went very well for me, and that's actually how it went. And unfortunately, it went very well. Uh, we were able to get a password, and from there, we were able to just start, you know, just tearing through the network with no issues, right? Does it sound stupid? Yes, it does. Does it work? Absolutely. Uh, last year, over 20% of the people that I called gave me their passwords freely over the phone uh, after a less than five-minute phone call. Uh, and that doesn't seem like a big number, but in uh, uh, an organization that has 100 people, that's 20 people. So something to think about. Uh, so here's one that didn't go so well for me, and I need one more uh, volunteer. Come on up. And what's your name? Mary. How about that? Let's give a big hand for Mary for me. All right, now, Mary, so uh, for this, this lady here, you're, you're sassy, okay? Oh, yeah. You're sassy, all right? You're sassy, and you know what's up, and, and, and you don't take no nothing from nobody, okay? Are you sure this isn't built after me? <laughs> did, you, did you fish me? Uh, I don't believe so, but maybe. Yeah. All right, so can you read the lines there, yeah. Thank you for calling DerbyCon. This is Mary. How can I help you? Hey, Mary, this is John from IT. How are you? Huh? Who did you say this was? Uh, this, this is John Smith from IT. How are you this morning? <laughs> you ain't John. But I'm, I'm sorry? I said you ain't John. Well, I mean, who else could I be? Okay. If you're John, what does he look like? Oh, you know, I'm about six foot, brown hair, rugged good looks. <laughs> you're, 
You crack me up. You ain't John, though. So, I'm, I'm sorry, Mary. I'm, I'm confused. Why, why do you think I'm not John? Because John is sitting right here in front of me. Nice try. Now, who's this? Bum, 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 bum. Thank you so much. So the reason that one didn't work is because John was sitting right in front of her. I got in too big of a hurry. I was making too many calls. I wasn't, you know, doing my proper research and things. They had a meeting that morning, and if I had spent two seconds reading their emails that I already had access to, I would have figured that out, and I would have realized, oh, they're in a meeting. She's going to know I'm not John. Lesson learned, right? So the lesson from that is if you're doing this, don't get in a hurry. Take your time. Take a breath between calls. Do your proper research. Uh, so some defense tips to prevent this, right? Use your users. They are often your first line of defense. Uh, you know, your users are oftentimes the ones that are going to be the first people that tell you, hey, I just got this weird call or, hey, this thing's going on. Uh, uh, one that I've not seen, uh, you know, that's not very popular, but that I would highly recommend is a callback system, right? If they get a phone call and they're not 100% sure of who it is, say, hey, if it's cool, let me get your number and I'll call you back, right? Um, and then a company-wide alert system. A lot of companies aren't doing this either. Um, if you have a company-wide alert system and there's an incident, whether it be some strange dude walking around or a phishing email or weird phone calls, whatever it might be, if you have a company-wide alert system and you tell your whole company, hey, by the way, this phishing email went out at 8 a.m. this morning. Keep your eyes out and alert IT. I promise you, you're not going to get as many clicks. Your users are going to be more aware. Their ears are going to perk up. Their eyes are going to open a little bit. And in the drudgery of their day-to-day -day stuff, they're going to go, you know, I did get a strange call this morning. I should probably report that. And then you can start kind of doing logging and checking and things like that. Um, and then reward good behavior. Uh, we want our users to help us, right? Uh, so reward good behavior, give them a gift card to Starbucks, whatever it is, right? 20 bucks is 20 bucks, but then, you know, they get it in their head. Oh man, I did something good. I'm going to be rewarded. It works. So let's talk about phishing. Uh, so what is phishing? And this is email based phishing that we're talking about. Uh, and it's an attempt to acquire sensitive information, right? You want usernames, passwords, credit card data, whatever it is. Uh, phishing is not that, unfortunately. Uh, you've got different types of phishing. You've got spear phishing, like a boss. Uh, whaling. Um, spear phishing and whaling, yeah. Uh, and then, so some really smart folks at UC Berkeley a few years ago uh, actually did a really concentrated, coordinated study uh, of some phishing statistics, right? Uh, they had a control group. Uh, and they fished them, and then they, they, they counted and researched all the individuals and then, and then interviewed them afterwards. Uh, and they said that good phishing websites fooled 90% of the participants, right? This was just a random group of, of people from all levels, backgrounds, and education stuff. 23% um, didn't look at the address for, 40% uh, made mistakes, uh, 15 out of the 22 participants proceeded without hesitation to just click links. Like, these are real numbers, and this is a control group, okay? Um, and then it didn't matter what, what where they came from, education background, sex, age, everyone was vulnerable to it. Uh, so a couple of phishing case studies that, that I took part in last year. Um, this was a company that didn't have any sort of formalized social engineering training. It was about 400 employees. We fished all of them. Uh, out of those 400, 115 people opened the email. 85 of those 115 clicked the malicious link, and then 72 entered their credentials, their working credentials, in the website we had set up. Again, that doesn't seem like a lot, but that's 72 clear text passwords we got in a matter of minutes. Okay? And these were elevated users. One of them was a domain admin. That's all it took. That's all it took. Just set up a fake website, type your stuff in. We were, we were golden. It was done. Uh, for the different company that actually had some social engineering training, it was about 200, uh, 200 plus employees. Uh, 37 of those employees actually opened the email, but only six users clicked the link, and then out of those two, only two uh, had entered credentials into the fake website. And those two users had not been on the company less than six months. So they were not ingrained in the culture. They hadn't been there long enough to be ingrained in the culture and get all the training and stuff. Um, but the CEO himself was actually sending out emails every day or every week about, hey, here's this new thing I saw. Here's this new technique. Uh, and interviewing the employees later, I said, you know, why, why didn't you guys click that? And they go, 
well, you know, Joe, the CEO, has been hitting us every day for the last three years about social engineering. Like, I knew I'd get fired if I clicked this. So, so it works. Uh, so, you want to do phishing? What do you need to do? Well, you need to gather emails first. Uh, so I go, well, where do I get emails from? Uh, again, the company website. Oftentimes, you'll see contact us. You'll see some emails there. Uh, you could scrape different forums that the company might be related to. Uh, and then social media again, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, there's a couple open source tools uh, that you can use. The Harvester, Recon NG, uh, Meta Goofill. Uh, Lee Baird made Discover Scripts. I love using that. That helps pull down a lot of good uh, working emails. Uh, Multigo. Um, and then I included this slide. Uh, it's really hard to read on the screen. But essentially, so you guys heard about the Facebook two-factor authentication, you know, kind of nonsense. So we're trying to push two-factor auth, right? We're like, oh, yeah, everyone have two-factor auth. Unfortunately, SMS two-factor auth is now being targeted for advertisements, right? Facebook kind of just, you know, shot themselves in the foot there. Uh, I thought this was a really good fish. I saw this uh, a few months back. And essentially what it was is a guy... Uh, you know, was was trying to get into a to a site or something, and he found the user's uh, phone number, but it was two-factor auth. It was using you know one of the only offshore two-factor auth things. So he goes, hey, you know, let me text this person to see if I could just kind of you know social engineering them. So he said, hey, uh, you know, this used to be my old number, and unfortunately, I'm trying to get into this site. Is it cool? You know, it's going to send you a code. Is it cool if you text me back that code? And they were like, yeah, sure, it's fine. I understand. Like, you got a new number. And it worked. They sent the they sent the the two factor auth code to him, and he was able to get in. Uh, so you know, wonderful there. I mean, that was that was great. Uh, a couple good phishing tools. Um, if you don't want to handwrite your own, you know, phishing exercise, uh, there's GoFish. Uh, there's a social engineering toolkit from our very own Dave Kennedy. Uh, uh, my buddy Adam Compton wrote Speed Phishing Framework there. Uh, there's Phishing Frenzy, fif, Fish Me, uh, excuse me, and uh, you can use Beef to hook browsers while you're doing while you're doing some good phishing. Uh, a couple uh, notes on on doing a uh, you know generic phishing setup. Obviously, you want to collect your emails. Uh, you want to choose and set up your weapon of choice. Um, you want to purchase a domain. You know something preferably close to the target's domain or related to the target's domain. So if they're Google.com and you see that Google.net is open, go ahead and buy it. Use it. People aren't looking that close. It seems, you know, as much as we drill into them, hey, look at the URL. They're not looking that close. And they go, Google.net, well, that's close enough. That's got to be from us, right? A lot of companies are not buying their .nets or .orgs or .eus. Uh, and you can use that and they go, oh, well, that's probably just a new website we set up. Yeah. Um, and then some other, some other stuff about getting a, you know, a good certificate from like Let's Encrypt. And then you want to craft a good web page and then craft a good email. So what makes like a good email? What makes a good fish? Uh, you know, I just chose three things. Authenticity, legitimacy, and relevancy. If it's not authentic, it's not going to fly. If it doesn't look legitimate, they're not going to click it. And if it's not relevant to the current date and time, they're going to know what's up, right? You want it to look and feel authentic. The time of the day is important. The subject matter is important. All of that is absolutely crucial if you want it to fly. Uh, so some good ideas of some good fishes that have worked in the past. Uh, current events, if there's an election or something going on or, or there's some big news article or something, you can use that as kind of your in, right? Um, uh, HR and employment verification. Hey, I'm from HR and I need to, you know, verify this employee. Is it cool? Can you give me this information? Um, any kind of benefits set up or 401k increase? The 401k increase is a really, really popular one. That's a big one. Uh, because who doesn't like more money, right? You send out an email and you say, hey, you know, this is the benefits company and we're sending, you know, a 401k, 15% company matching increase or whatever. Like everybody in the brother's going to click that. Why you, Why not? Free money? Heck yeah. Um, a birthday setup. That works. You go, hey, by the way, it's Tara's birthday, which you found on LinkedIn, by the way. And you go, well, we're going to throw her a surprise party. If you don't mind, click this link to sign up so that you can get paper plates and things like that for us. Click the link. Oh, man, I got to log in. Do -do -do -do. Sign up. Now you've got credentials, you know, it's great. Uh, and then the benefits change. Uh, so real world phishing example, this is the 401k thing that I was telling you about. Uh, you know, you start out, again, legitimacy, the day, it's Friday, right? Send it out, you know, not too early in the morning, but right before lunch, so they're checking their email before lunch before they go eat. Um, 
started out with first line. We said, hey, you know, we love you guys. We appreciate all you do. Okay, that sounds great. As Because we love you guys and appreciate all you do, we're doing this thing for you. We're going to increase our, our company matching 401k. Oh, man, that sounds awesome. Cool. Okay. Uh, if you don't mind, just click this little link for me here. Log in with your credentials, and then you can select your company matching thing. The link looks correct. When you hovered over it, it looked like uh, a domain that the company might have owned. Uh, and that was where we got, you know, 97 clicks or whatever it was. And then you say, thank you and have a great weekend. And you say, hey, it's company name, membership benefits team, you know, and then a made up, you know, 401k company. Uh, this is a failure. This is an example of a failure of a bad phishing uh, email that has gone out. You can see, need extra cash drive with Lyft, woo. But you look here and it says direction.lt, whatever, junk, dot, junk, dot, junk. Uh, and, you know, Google even marks it as spam. So, I mean, they're not even trying with a lot of this stuff, right? But you go and you follow that link and you find out that it's actually trying to hook your browser and do, do a bunch of bad stuff. Uh, so say you've never done phishing and you want to practice at home, right? Uh, Cobalt Strike, the Cobalt Strike team actually put together a great tool called Morning Catch. Uh, it's a free VM. You can find it on the website. Uh, you download it and you run it and you can actually fish users from this VM and craft emails and kind of practice and things like that. Um, and it's also a vulnerable VM, so if you want to do, you know, some hacking stuff on the side, you can. Uh, it's actually really, really good. So if you want to practice that, check it out. It's totally free, you know, for the community. Uh, and then, as I promised, some defense tips, right? Again, use your users. If you have that alert system in place, if you're, if you're allying with your users and you're saying, hey, look, you're not going to get in trouble if you come to us. If you just contact me and say, hey, this looks a little suspicious, we're going to take a look at it and we're going to reward you. Like, we're going to take care of you because you're taking care of us. Um, and then having, again, having the training, having some bad emails go up, having some uh, fish emails that may have been sent go up on a screen like this and say, hey, look, you know, these are some of the stuff we've been hit with in the last six months. You know, this is, this is some of the stuff to look out for. And then get your users to question everything. You want them to question everything, right? Even if you get inundated with 50 emails a day from users going, is this legitimate? That's okay. That's what you want. You would rather them ask you before they click than get popped later. So let's talk about the fizzle. This is this seems to be everyone's favorite one, popular one. So a couple terms to think about with physical. Uh, we've got piggybacking, which refers to uh, anytime a person is tagging along with another person, uh, who is authorized to gain entry into a restricted area or past a certain checkpoint, right? So if you're walking into a building behind an employee, they've swiped their badge or badged in, that's piggybacking, right? And tailgating is kind of the same, but it implies you're doing it without consent. Uh, such as, you know, holding a door open with your foot or grabbing the doors, it's getting ready to close, that sort of stuff. So some preparation, okay? Customers called you, hey, we want you to do a fiscal for us. You got to get ready, right? It takes it takes a little bit of preparation. First off, you need consent. You got to get that consent written, on paper, printed off, signed, everything else. You want to get your objectives. A lot of companies aren't aware of, oh, well, when you break in, what next, right? They just think, oh, you break in and that's it. Well, not necessarily. You want to say, hey, do you want us to get into the server room? Do you want us to get into the CEO, CEO's office? Do you want us to steal stuff? You know, whatever it is. Start doing some research about the company, the culture, the ethics, when they were founded, who works there, dress code, that kind of stuff. Uh, if it's a suit and tie place and you show up in jeans, you're going to stick out. If it's a jeans place and you show up in a suit and tie, you're going to stick out. So do your research uh, and then come up with a story. And oftentimes you'll work with your point of contact on that uh, to come up with a legitimate story of why you're sitting on site. And we'll go over some stories here in a minute. Um, and then to, to go along with your story, kind of get your costume together, okay? And when I say costume, I mean whatever it is that you're going to use to try to get into the building. Um, and then get into character. So you're play acting, right? You're breaking into this building. You're not you. You are whatever this character may be. You're a painter there to paint the walls. You're a carpet guy there to, to roll some carpet, right? You're a generic telecom guy there to work on the lines to get them fast internet, you know, free upgrades. And then figure out escape plan. Um, if you start to look at the building uh, when you're doing your OSINT and you go, okay, if I get popped over here, can I leave via this door? Start kind of coming up with that stuff, kind of figuring out, okay, or if I get stopped, you know, what's my story going to be? How can I talk my way out of this? You don't want to go in there and, and start fumbling going, uh, da, da, because then you're going to get popped and they're going to throw you out or possibly get you arrested. Uh, so 
part of the preparation is to do some physical oversight. Google Maps is an absolutely great resource. They have that satellite view, gives you a nice overhead as well as like a street level view of the building, and you can just circle around it on Google Maps before you even leave the building, right? Before you even leave your office. Um, I use this example because this is just, you know, place from here and home. Uh, but you could see cameras, you could see uh, entryways, you could see, you know, windows and stuff, all sorts of stuff for free on Google Maps. And a lot of companies will put their Google Maps picture up there, just whatever, and you go, oh, well, they've got two cameras at the entrance there, and they've got a roll door in the back, and, you know, yada, yada, yada. You've already done half your work there. Um, the company website will oftentimes have pictures. You know, they're trying to create this culture of openness and things, and they'll have photos of their users and stuff in front of the building. And you go, oh, well, there's a door with two cameras, or, oh, there's, you know, open window there. Uh, so things to watch out for. And then uh, doing drive-bys. I like to do drive-bys the night before. Um, if I'm worried about things like cameras or license plate taggers or things like that, I'll get an Uber and I'll have my Uber driver just drive me around the building. Hey, man, if you don't mind, let's just drive in this parking lot real quick. Just kind of slow for me, if you don't mind. I've never been questioned. Uber drivers are just like, whatever, it's a job, you know, whatever. Um, or a taxi or whatever. Uh, and have them just drive around the building, have them drive around the parking lot, you know, kind of take a look, maybe even take some pictures, you know, and then have them leave because you're going to be in a different car with a different license plate. So if they even log that event as, hey, some strange car was driving around, it's not your car. Uh, so let's talk about costuming. Uh, you need a costume, right, for whatever, you know, goal, your, your, your main goal is or whatever a character you're going to go in as. Um, popular one I like to go in as is just a generic telecom worker. Uh, you tell the users, hey, we're here to get you some, you know, some internet upgrades, some faster internet, broadband upgrades or whatever. They're more than happy to let you crawl into their desk. They're more than happy to let you in the building, in the server room, all that stuff. Um, a Best Buy employee, you know, the Geek Squad or, or anything like that. Um, any kind of, you, you can go on Amazon and buy any kind of generic, it's just IT, kind of polo and slacks. Um, and if it's not the main headquarters, you could say, oh, headquarters sent me here. And oftentimes that you're in. I've also gone in as a painter. Uh, I've also gone in as a carpet guy. And I'll tell you those stories here in a minute. Uh, you need some props to look legitimate, right? If you're a generic telecom worker and you walk in with a briefcase, probably not going to fly. You're a generic telecom worker and you walk in with, say, a tool bag, some work boots, uh, you know, uh, a um, clipboard, things like that, or, you know, some cable hanging off your, your hip. That's going to fly a lot better. That's going to get you in a lot easier. Um, and then going on and buying a, uh, you know, a set of measuring tape and things like that to kind of, you know, keep on your hip, even though you're not going to use it, that adds to the legitimacy of the character that you're trying to sell. Uh, some additional tools that you'll need. Obviously, you want to carry around that get out of jail free card. That's something that you, your company and your, uh, your target are all going to sign. You're all going to talk over. Uh, you're going to have that on you at all times, usually on your clipboard or on your person. And if you get stopped and you can't talk your way out of it and you know you're, it's about to escalate, then you're going to pop that out discreetly and kind of take them over and say, hey, look, here's my get-out-of-jail-free card. Uh, it's going to say things like the company name, what you're there to do, your point of contact. Very important sign note with that, too. Have your point of contact have their phone on at all times and available. Do not go do a physical and then your point of contact is in the Bahamas with their phone off because then you're going to stand there and look really, really awkward. So have a point of contact and have a backup point of contact and ensure that they know, please keep your phone on because I don't want to go to jail. Um, uh, and, then, and then carry around your nefarious stuff. Uh, you've got lock picks, um, a lot of the Hack 5 tools like the Rubber Ducky, the Land Turtle, uh, things like that. Uh, carry around a small flashlight. Um, you'd be surprised how many uh, closets I have found myself hiding in uh, or dark offices I have found myself hiding in that if I turned the lights on, they would have got me. But because the light was off and I was behind the door, then I was able to kind of sneak around and do whatever I needed to. Let's carry around a small flashlight with you. Um, you can go on to like Sparrows or Fools to buy some lock picks, uh, some Lloyd tools, things like that. A uh, can of compressed air. Uh, oftentimes there's locks. You can do the compressed air trick and uh, blow compressed air up into the lock and it'll, it'll pop it. And I'll show you a cool video about that. Um, and then going online and buying uh, some, some faux prox cards, some fake prox cards, right? These are 10 bucks. You can buy a pack of 50 of them. And then you carry that with you on your hip 
uh, you know, on a badge or something. And then when you're trying to badge into these maglocks and they're like, oh man, my badge doesn't work. I don't know what happened. Oftentimes people go, oh, your badge doesn't work. Come on in. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, they're sending me a new one. Sounds stupid, but again, it works. Um, uh, Inc. Uh, Inc.com actually uh, did a video with uh, David Kennedy and Paul Koblitz. Uh, it's a nine-minute video, so we won't watch it here, but uh, it's really interesting uh, watch. So go check it out. It's on YouTube. Um, they actually break into, I think, a Fortune 5 company um, with the Ink reporters. And, you know, obviously this was all consensual, uh, but the Ink reporters just stunned the whole time. He just could not believe how easy it was for these two guys to just walk into the building freely, drop their, you know, drop the nefarious device and walk out. Didn't get stopped once. Uh, so if you kind of want to see uh, some more of the thought process in like a real time uh, uh, physical pen test, go check that video out. So let's get into some stories. I'm calling the first one the financial job. Uh, and that was, a, you know, a nice little cartoon that kind of, you know, describes what happened there. And uh, this is kind of what it looked like in, in person. So. Uh, I was hired by a, a large financial institution. Uh, they said, hey, see if you can get into our buildings. And if you can, see if you can get behind uh, the Taylor area to where the money is. And I said, okay. So I did my OSIN. I started, you know, driving around, looking at the buildings, and I realized they had cameras at uh, uh, license plate level. So they were, you know, taking pictures of license plates as people were driving in and out. Um, I had looked on Google Maps, and I had seen that, you know, everything was locked down pretty good. They had cameras everywhere. You know, it, it's it's a financial institution. It's not it's not going to be easy to break into. Oh, okay, I can't climb on the roof. I can't break any windows or anything like that because you know it's just not going to go good. So I thought, okay, let me just walk in the front door and see what happens, right? So I decided that my way in is going to be the generic telecom worker. I grab my tool bag, my work boots, dusty jeans, generic polo, and I just walk in there, you know, like I own the place. Um, I go to the first lady and I shake her hand and I say, hey, I'm from this generic telecom company. I'm here to do some work. Uh, we've got to take some measurements because uh, they're they're dropping some more lines in to get you guys some better internet. And shook my hand. She said, oh, yeah, sure, come on back. Open the teller area for me and just let me walk on back in there. Uh, and I'm laying tape measure and taking pictures of me dropping rubber duckies and things like that. Was not questioned. They just assumed, I, again, I just assumed I was there and I belonged there. Uh, right by the money, right by the checks, right by the safe, the vault and stuff like that. Uh, and then walked back out and I asked the, uh, you know, I asked the point of contact later. I said, Hey, you know, why was that so easy? He goes, well, unfortunately that branch does not get, um, as good a training as, you know, some of our other branches. And we knew that was an issue. Um, so all in all, I was able to just walk into a bank off the street, just Joe Schmo, do whatever I wanted for five, 10 minutes and then leave. Uh, so unfortunately that one didn't go well. Now at another branch, I did the exact same thing. Soon as I walked in the front door, though, I had two people greeting me going, hey, can we help you? Yeah, yeah, I'm here to take some measurements and stuff. Oh, okay, cool. Let's walk you into this office over here and call and make sure that you actually belong on site. They did not leave me alone. They did not let me in the back area. Uh, I always had a guard or an escort with me at all times. They called their point of contact. The point of contact said, we don't know who he is. They walked me back out the front door and said, if, you see us, if we see you again, we're calling the police. It was like night and day. That is what we wanted to see. They got a big round of applause. We were, I was just thrilled. I was absolutely thrilled to see that. That, just, that. that was perfect. And the difference between the two was one was getting usual updates and usual training and usual awareness stuff, and the other one was not. That was, that was literally the only difference. Uh, asked them later, hey, when I walked up, what, what triggered that you, you didn't think I belonged? And they said, well, we didn't receive an update that morning that we were going to have visitors. And HQ sends us updates whenever we have visitors. So, again, it was, it was good. It worked. Uh, the other kind of fun job that I did uh, was a large utility company. So, again, they called me up. They said, hey, we'd like you to break in here. We've got uh, mag locks on all the doors, so we don't think you're going to be able to get in. I said, okay, cool. We'll, you know, we'll see. So I do my drive around and they've got big gates up all over everything and cameras everywhere and, and checkpoints, you know, and all this stuff. I thought, man, this, this is going to be kind of a tough one. So I get to the checkpoint, drive around, all the gates are up, all the gates are locked, everything's locked. I'm like, oh man, I'm not going to be able to get in here. But then I see a side door that just has a single camera over it. 
And it's just a regular side door. There's no mag lock on it, nothing. I thought, oh, okay, that's weird. So I park across the street, just kind of walk up to the mag door, uh, look at it, kind of jimmy it, and I see that it's open. Oh, this, this is open. I just kind of push, and it pushes open, right? Let's see if the picture's in here. It's not. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's right there. So I push it, and on the other side of this door is, please make sure this door is locked every day when you leave. So they were aware that the door is a little tricky, and unfortunately maintenance hadn't gotten to it at that point, so I was in the building. I thought, oh, oh, all right, cool, I'm in the building, yeah, all right. So I push in, I go in, and, you know, right there by the by the uh, door, there were all the uniforms, you know, that the utility workers would check out for the day and wear. Uh, there was all their tools, their empty network jacks. So I'm like, all right, this is cool, I'm, I'm all right with this. I walk around the corner, and there's a meeting of all the utility workers just sitting right there. And here I am off the street, you know, carrying a clipboard and stuff. And I just walked, I literally just walked in this guy, like, you know, twice my size. I stumble back and, oh, uh, and they all turn and they go, can we help you? And I go, oh, no, 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 you're good, fella. Sorry, it was just taking measurements. Carry on. Hey, appreciate what you're doing. Carry on. And just kind of squeeze my way past them, you know, and just kind of, you know, and they're all looking at me like, who the heck is this guy? Why is he doing the building? Get on through. And then I'm like, oh, crap, I got to hide. Like, these guys are going to come after me. Uh, so I go to duck into an empty room and two guys, you know, are, what, what are you doing? Duck into this room. What are you doing here, man? Can I help you? I thought, oh crap. Okay. I'm, I'm done. Like I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually from the carpet company and I got lost. Uh, you guys are getting new carpets and salt. He goes, oh yeah, you're the carpet guy. All right, cool. He goes, let me take you over here to where the carpet. So no joke, right? This guy walked me into the offices where they were getting the carpets and helped me take measurements. He held the he held the, the the tape measure for me and helped me write stuff down and he was just very very helpful and I, man I appreciate it thank you so much I said I'm gonna go over here and, and finish taking measurements he goes yeah you're good you enjoy the rest of your day I said man I appreciate it and that was it I had free access to the building right uh, so that objective was done so they said hey see if you can get into the front I said okay so I go into the front uh, and big nice bulletproof glass and everything's all locked up I thought okay all right this is gonna be a little bit tougher. So the lady's like, can I help you? I said, hey, I just want to use your bathroom real quick. Oh, okay, cool. It's back there. So I go to the bathroom and I kind of wait. I don't actually go in the bathroom. I just kind of wait outside the door because the secured area had a door right by the bathroom, right? It's just kind of opened up. So I sat there like 15 minutes waiting for somebody to come out. Finally, somebody comes out. They're on the phone. They're looking down. They're not paying attention. So I just kind of walk up as quick as I can, stick my foot there and wait for them to go on, you know, go on in and finish passing stuff. And I kind of look, you know, make sure nobody sees me. Just open the door and walk right in. And the lady on the other side of the door whose office was there saw me. And I was just like, hi. And she was just like, hi. And walk on in. So at this point, I'm in. And the, the assumption is, well, he's in. He's carrying a clipboard. Obviously, he belongs, right? So I go and I start trying all the offices and dropping devices and things like that. Um, this picture here is actually in the CEO's office. And that's his personal um, iPad. So I grabbed that and I decided I'm going to take that with me. And then uh, this here is the uh, entrance into the server room. So I'm sitting outside the server room like, well, the server room's locked. Let me see if I can get into the, to the roof or something. And uh, there's a lady's office right across from the server room. And I go to the lady and I say, hey, um, you know, is there a ladder or something I can use? You know, I just need to check something. She's like, no, there's no ladder. But hey, borrow my chair. You can have my chair and I'll hold it for you. So she brings out her chair for me and holds it for me. I climb up and, you know, I take some pictures and stuff. Uh, and I say, you know what? No, I'll just get a ladder. It's good. Um, I took that uh, iPad to my point of contact and just said, hey, this is the CEO's iPad and walked away. And this was literally his uh, impression or, or, or uh, you know, his expression. Uh, yeah, he was not. He was, he, what? How did you what? put that? Put that back. Oh, OK. Uh, Sorry. Uh, so, how do we avoid having guys like me walk into a building, right? Again, security awareness and training. Uh, putting up posters at all the entrances really works. Putting up awareness training. Hey, don't let people tailgate. Don't let people in the building. Check badges. Check visitor logs. Things like that. Uh, periodic reminders and then sending out emails and things like that. Uh, you know, some C-level guys, they know that security awareness is a big issue. And they're just like, eh, it's fine. We need money for other things. Um, other guys are like, nope, nope, it's all bad. We just need a panic button. It's all bad, right? And those are the ones that I've always had an impossible or really hard time trying to break down. I couldn't get any fishes, couldn't get any calls, couldn't get in the building. 
And then the biggest thing to take away from is safety, right? The safety of the employees is absolutely paramount. You've got computers, you've got iPads, you've got all this stuff, right? And that's all, that's all well and fine. That can all be replaced, but human life cannot be replaced. You don't know who that guy is walking in off the street that's trying to get into your building. And the safety of the employees is 100% the most important thing. If you know that tailgating is a problem and you know that people are just walking in your, in your back door and he's got a pile of donuts and your employees are like, yeah, let him in. He's got donuts or yeah, let him in. He's got a clipboard. That is a huge safety concern. Never mind the equipment, never mind the loss of data, none of that stuff. The safety of the employees is absolutely paramount. So you want a social engineer. Well, how do you be good at it, right? Confidence is key. It's the big thing. You need to, if you're act, if you are that part, you need to act that part. You need to know you are that part. You were that painter. You were that whatever. You were that guy. Uh, spend some, spend a lot of time doing some open source intelligence gathering. Really kind of dig in and do your research. Spend a few days kind of taking a look at the stuff. Uh, take lots of notes, right? Don't forget times and dates and names and things like that because it's going to trip you up when the rubber meets the road. And then practice, as stupid as it sounds, practice with a spouse, practice with a friend, practice from the mirror, you know, really get your, really get your, your mind getting into that, because you're play acting, really getting into that character. Uh, some additional training, uh, there's lots and lots of YouTube videos, there's lots of pictures and, and videos of folks breaking into buildings or doing fishing or, or talking about pretexting, things like that. Uh, Joe Gray, uh, Christopher Hagney actually wrote the book on it, wrote a book on it. Uh, Jason Street does some training. Uh, Kevin Mitnick, we all know him. He wrote several books on it. And they come to conferences like this, come to DerbyCon, B-Sides, DEF CON, your local ISSA chapter, things like that. Uh, I always like to throw out some books that I like reading. Uh, again, there's Christopher Hagney's book there, Jason Street's, um, and then a couple books that Kevin Mitnick wrote. So if you want to get into social engineering, go pick these up. These are absolutely 100% beneficial. They are great reads. So with that, any questions? Push in there. Oh, microphone. Where to put it? Aha. There you go. Uh, so one of the things you said was that confidence is key and practice makes perfect. Yes. Um, so beyond just practicing with family members in front of a mirror, do you recommend any other techniques? Like what do you use to get in a character for before? Um, so oftentimes I'll talk to, um, you know, I'll get a buddy or somebody and I'll change it up. I'll get a friend or a coworker or something and I'll go, hey, can you give me a few minutes uh, of your time? And I will literally practice my, my pretext or my fish or whatever it is on them. And then I'll ask for feedback. Hey, you know, did that sound authentic? You know, what could I have done better? And even so far as walking up to them, carrying my stuff, you know, my props or whatever it is, that kind of stuff. That really helps. So it's kind of a two-part question, but it's around uh, phishing emails. So say you have a enterprise phishing campaign. Um, do you recommend a protocol procedure, like say same person clicks on, you know, fails three times in a row, four times in a row, like implications, and then like the wall of shame, or say you like someone high up, CO, CIO, CTO, falls for the same thing. What, what, well, what do you do, do about that, right? And that's that's actually a good question, and and I've been asked that several times. So for the first one, we don't want to shame anybody. Um, you know, it, it it's fun here at conferences like this. We do the wall of sheep and the wall of shame stuff, but when it comes to employees, we want to ally with them, right? If they're failing two or three times then you need to sit back and look at the training program. Or you just need to talk to them, bring them into a conference room and go, what's causing you to click on this? You're not in trouble, you're not getting fired. I just want to know, what's causing you to click on this? Why aren't you coming to us? You know, Talk to us. And then just talk to them and, and, and hear them out and listen to them. Um, oftentimes, at least what I've found, is they just don't know, right? They just don't know or they get in a hurry or you know something happens. Um, we, don't want, we don't want employees to be scared to uh, report to IT for fear of failure, fear of, of getting you know uh, fired or anything like that. We want them to come to us with, "Hey, I screwed up. You know, I clicked this thing. Whatever. What what can I do?" And you go, "You know what? That's cool. We're going to give you some remedial training. You're not getting fired. Here's some remedial training. Here's the reasons why." And then even just showing them, showing them like, "Look, these are our passwords. We got popped last week, and all our passwords were just sent to this guy because you know A, B, and C clicked." We can't have that because we're going to get in trouble. Um, any other questions? Nope. Oh, I'm right there. Yeah. Gotcha. Oh, good. I see the sign. <laughs>
Okay. Thank you guys so much for coming. I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you.